I would like to invite, there we go, I'd like to invite Keith Farron up. I first encountered Keith at a pastor's retreat where, um, a covenant pastor's retreat, and you're teaching in the book of Philippians, and one of the things that Keith is known for is actually memorizing large passages of the scripture. So he recited the book of Philippians and then began teaching in it. Um, and th I mean, that experience itself was extremely moving. But the reason why I asked Keith to come here and is, um, well, for two reasons. One is because we just, we, we long to be people who deepen our love for the Word. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the, the kind of the hallmark of your ministry. And so we're just, we just want a piece of your spirit. So you okay. just pour that into <laughs> us. And of course, the second reason is, is Keith is one of the speakers with the, uh, with the Grand Parenting Summit that we're going to be a simulcast location for coming up. So mm -hmm. as you get to know Keith, it also is kind of a link to this is some of the kind of teaching that you hear at the Grand Parenting oh, yeah. Summit because, of course, they want you there for the very same reason right. because there's few things that we want more than for the next generation to fall in love with Jesus Amen. and to connect with him through his word. So Amen. with all that in mind, um, please give a warm Columbia Grove welcome to Keith Farron. All right. Hi. Everybody always says good morning, and so formal. And well, it is. It was a beautiful drive over. My lovely wife Carrie came with me. Got up early, and we headed over from Kirkland this morning. Came over the mountain and saw the mountain. Saw the sunrise. Drove right into the sunrise for a little while, and then we came into this. Smoky. We've been here before. We know that you guys live in an amazingly beautiful place. And, and so it is, it is good to be here. I know, yes, I'm going to be a part of the Grand Parenting Summit. So I, I know that here you guys get to see the sun a lot. But in Kirkland, it's going to be right about the time that the weather is starting to get all gray. And those of us that are speaking at the Grand Parenting Summit... Uh, I know the simulcast is going to be all over the place, but I'm going to be suffering for Jesus in Jacksonville, Florida. So, you know, pray for me. I'm going to have to go to Florida when it's gray in Seattle. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so that will be really, really fun. And I know that for a lot of your connection groups, you're going to be diving into the gospel of Mark, starting right away and coming and discussing it. And so... I, I just am thrilled that Andrew invited me to come on, on this day because my desire, I've got a really, really simple but huge goal for this morning. That is, the next time you read your Bible, I want you to like it more. Not just believe it better, not just trust it, not just apply it. All of that, yep, I want you to do that too. But I want you to enjoy it. I want you to like it more. Because I find that for most people who fill up our churches every weekend, the Bible is the one aspect of their life with Jesus that is more of a should than a want. Do, do you guys want to come and worship together? Do you want to be in community with other believers? Do you want to make a difference in your community and the world? Do you want to hear good preaching do you want to, you, all, the, we, we, and then some, sometimes I find for so many, this comes up in conversation and we go, yeah, I should read that more. I should be more consistent. I should know it better after being around the church for 132 years. I should, you know, that, for so many, the want of the conversation of our life of faith in Christ Shifts to should. And I got, I got to tell you, that was me the first 25 years I was hanging out with Jesus. I believed that it was true. It was something that I grew up in the church. I was one of those kids born on Saturday, church on Sunday, and then spent a good part of my elementary school years in central Kansas at Salina First Covenant Church. And uh, so we went Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night for three different sermons, because that's what you do in the Midwest. Right, and, uh, and so it was something where I, I, I really liked church. 
I was always involved in music and Sunday school and youth group and summer camp and then mission trips. And, and after college, I didn't feel like growing up, so I became a youth pastor. And I spent six years as a youth pastor at Hope Covenant Church in Lakewood, Washington. And all throughout, I would say that that my time in the Word, while I would, I would have seasons of consistency and then inconsistency, and, and I always felt like I should be more consistent, and I, and I probably should like it more than I do, but I found that, that I believed it, and I trusted it, and I sought to apply it, but it was always something I felt like I should do more. And then I can even point back. The reason that I can have a simple but huge goal for this morning is that I pray that September 25th, 2022 for you is your April 18th, 1993 for me. Because April 18th, 1993 is when everything started to shift for me. Everything started to shift. I, it was a few days before that, and I was having lunch with a buddy of mine who was a youth pastor at another church in Tacoma. And he said to me, he said, hey, Keith, I don't know what to make of this. There's this guy coming to our church Sunday night, and he's memorized the entire gospel of Luke. And he gets up on stage with no sets, no props, no costumes, no other actors and actresses, and he quotes it. And while he quotes it, he kind of acts it out. Well, as you might imagine, the first thought that went through my head was, that's a lot. <laughs> right? The second thought, which I actually said out loud, was, are people really going to sit and listen to that for almost two hours? I mean, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful or sacrilegious or anything, but my idea about what memorized, quoted scripture sounded like brought me back to my elementary school days growing up at Salina First Covenant Church, where once a year they would stand the second grade Sunday school class up in front of big church, and one at a time really frightened eight-year-olds would go. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but I have eternal life. John 3.16. And then the next kid. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one only son. Hi, mom. <laughs> right? Anybody ever seen this happen? There's this total disconnect for me between memorized, quoted scripture and good drama. Right? But I figured if somebody could make it somewhat interesting, it would be this guy. His name is Bruce Kuhn, and he had been in the Broadway cast of Les Mis, which I <laughs> hear is above average. And, uh, and so I went... No great spiritual motivation. I went to support my buddy who was on staff at the church and to see if somebody could do it. I mean, I had never heard of anything like that. And the best way that I can describe what happened for me on April 18th, 1993, is the living word of God went from being a phrase to a reality. I saw it come alive. It lived. And, and not only did I stay through the whole thing, I had sat in a place where I thought that I, I could kind of sneak out at intermission. So I thought after about an hour of listening to somebody quote the Bible, I'd be done. But I not only stayed through the whole thing, but I went up to Bruce afterwards and I said, hey, they mentioned you were going to be in Seattle from New York for the whole week doing different presentations. They didn't say anything about tomorrow. Can I take you to lunch? And he said, sure. So I picked him up at noon and dropped him back off at his hotel at 9 p.m. <laughs> no joke. Spent the whole day together. And he just started talking about the Bible very differently from anybody I'd ever heard before. He started saying some things like, well, what if instead of studying this little piece and this little piece and this little piece and then memorizing this verse and this verse and this verse, he said, what if you just took a book of the Bible and you just soaked in it until you know it? And when you know it, you move on. <laughs> and I remember thinking, okay, my whole life I've heard about studying the Bible and memorizing verses. Never heard anybody talk about soaking in it, hanging out with it, right? So I took him up on his challenge you know, he had done Luke. I want to do something different. So I chose Philippians. And uh, I just read Philippians. I, I, I just decided that for that summer of 93, I would just read Philippians every day. And so I read Philippians. And the next day I read Philippians again. And the next day I read Philippians. And, and I had read Philippians before. 
right? But it had always been a four-day deal. Why? Because there are four chapters, and a chapter a day keeps the devil away, right? I don't know. <laughs> it was one of those. It was one of those things where I, it had always been a four-day deal that I was told somewhere along the line you're supposed to read a chapter a day. But I realized after a few days that for the first time in my life I was reading this letter the way that you would actually read a letter, right? I mean, I'm guessing somebody in here has heard that Philippians is a letter, right? I, okay, so it's a letter from, the, from Paul to the church in Philippi, and let's say that you open up your mailbox tomorrow, and there's a letter in it. Remember those? <laughs> and there's a letter in it. Handwritten on the outside is your name, And in the upper left-hand corner is the name of somebody you love you haven't seen in a few years. And you open it up and there's a four-page handwritten letter in it. And the first line on page one is, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. You Would you read page one and go, whew, I'm spent. I better save page two for tomorrow. Right? Four Four days from now, I'll finish this off. No way. You'd read the whole thing, realize you're still standing by your mailbox, and you should probably go inside, and then you'd sit down, and you'd read it again, and you'd soak it in. And that's what that summer, that experience was. And I found a couple things were happening. One, I found that I finally understood what meditating on Scripture was all about, because I had soaked in that one book enough that God could bring it to my mind at times when I wasn't holding my Bible. Right, when I, because I, I don't know about you, maybe it's just me, but the most difficult times for me to live out the truths that I find in here, it's typically not during my quiet time. That's not usually my time of greatest struggle. My time of greatest struggle is typically when I'm out in the world, right, dealing with these things called people. Right, that's when it gets tough, and I kind of need to have the the truths, the encouragement, the challenge, the precepts, everything of Scripture, I need that to be in my mind at times other than when I'm actually reading my Bible, or it's going to be really hard for me to live it out. And so that was happening because I knew it now. It was was something that that as as I read Philippians over and over, I was driving down the street one time, and was thinking through Philippians, just thinking through it, and realized that as I was thinking through it and just kind of saying it out loud, I had gone about three paragraphs without making a mistake. And I went, ooh, memorizing scripture without trying. This is good, I really like this. This is, I had memorized scripture before, you know, but it was always really, really hard for me. Now, I persevered because there was usually candy involved. But, uh, (laughs) But it was always hard, and I realized that I hadn't just memorized Philippians, I had internalized it. It was that summer of 93 that I stopped using the word memorization and started using the word internalization. Because I think that when I use the word internalize, I think that the goal is to know the word, not just to know the words. And, and so to make a long story just a little longer, I got to the end of that fall and and I realized, I, I want to know the life of Jesus like this. I want the life of Jesus just saturating my heart and mind. And so in 94, I made one New Year's resolution, and that was to internalize the Gospel of John. I was just going to read the Gospel of John over and over again until I knew it. And so I started reading and reading and reading. Little did I know that God was in the process of changing my whole course of ministry. Because starting in 96, March 3rd of 1996 was the first time that I stood up on stage at what was then North Seattle Covenant Church, is now Shoreline Covenant Church, and presented the Gospel of John the way that Bruce had done with Luke three years earlier for me. And that launched what I've been doing for the last 26 years because I have to share Scripture. Because Scripture... When I, when I think about the Gospel of John, it no longer sounds like, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, He was with God in the beginning. It doesn't sound like that anymore. It sounds a little bit more like, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word 
was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. Now, there came a man who was sent from God. His name is John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him, all people might believe. He himself was not the light. He testified only to the light. The true light that gives light to every person was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh, lived for a while among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, The man who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Amen? First 18 verses of the Gospel of John. We could do the rest, but Andrew said I had 40-ish minutes instead of two hours, so I guess we'll, you know, move on. So if you are going to be diving into the Gospel of Mark in one of these connection groups, or you're going to be studying something else with another group, or you're going to be studying... As you move forward in your time in the Word, tomorrow and for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, I want to share with you this morning some of the the tips, some of the ideas that have, have helped transform my own time in the Word. The first two are really kind of mindset, what, how we approach the Bible, uh, and, and the rest are all, what do we do when we actually have our Bibles in our hands? So the first, first is we need to read the Bible relationally, not informationally. We need to read the Bible relationally, not informationally. For most of us, we read the Bible. When I ask people, why do you read the Bible? And they say, well, it's God's word and I want to know how he wants me to live so I can live a life that honors and glorifies him. And that all sounds good. It is good. It's just not the purpose of the Bible. This is the only book that has ever been written in the history of bookdom with the sole purpose of drawing into a relationship with its author. The purpose of this book is relational, not informational. Now, is there information in here? Absolutely. I'm not saying there's not information in here. But maybe this analogy will help. Like, Andrew and I have known each other for a few years, but we've only seen each other a handful of times in environments where we haven't had a lot of long conversations, just the two of us. But I know him well enough to know that if I moved to Wenatchee, we'd probably be friends. He might not feel the same way, but I have the microphone. And as you've seen, his microphone doesn't work today. And so... (laughs) Mine doing fine. And so let's say that I moved to Wenatchee and Andrew and I decide that for the foreseeable future, we'll grab a cup of coffee once a week. Okay. Over the course of the weeks to come, 
would Andrew and I learn some information about each other? Right? I'm guessing that we would. Right? So, like, what brought us to Wenatchee? And, you know, he's got his arm around somebody. I'm assuming that's his wife. And my wife's right here, but we don't know how we met each other's wives. And I don't know if he has kids. We haven't talked about our kids yet. And so, and I don't know, do you like sports? Do you not like sports? Do you like music? Obviously, you like music. Do you like technology? Do you like gadgets? Do you like cars? Do you, I, I don't know. I, we just don't. There's a lot of information we would learn about each other over the course of the weeks to come. So let's imagine that week one, we show up at the coffee shop and we get our coffee, we sit down in our comfy chairs, and, and then I pull out my notepad. And written across the top of the notepad, it says, 47 things I need to know about Andrew for him to be my friend. <laughs> so how did you meet your wife? Do you have any kids? How old are they? What brought you to Wenatchee? Are you a tech guy? Do you prefer playing guitar? Do you prefer playing piano? Did you start by singing? How did that whole music thing come about? You know, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? You know, important questions. Now, Andrew's a nice guy. He would probably answer the questions. But let me ask you this. What's the chance of him showing up week two? You know? <laughs> Not really good. You know, I'd, I'd fire off a text and I'd be like, I had a great time last week. Are we still on for tomorrow morning? And he would text me back. I'm so sorry, man. Something came up. I'm busy forever. <laughs> but don't we so frequently do that with God? We, we pull out our Bible and we pull out our devotional book and we, there's a little piece of scripture we're supposed to read and so we read a little bit, piece of scripture and, and then we read little words about the devotional piece and then we have the questions we're supposed to answer and once we've answered our questions, we must be done. So we close our Bible and our devotional book and we put them down and we pray, God, please let me remember what it is I've read today and we don't. So often that's the experience. Sometimes I think that we leave our time with God having spent no time with God at all. Now, I, I, please don't hear me say that all devotionals are bad. You should never use a devotional. You should only read. I mean, I've, on the table back there, there are some devotionals that I've written. So I'm not against devotionals. Uh, but when they become the check mark to-do list of what our time with God is supposed to look like, and we've answered the questions, so we're done with our time with God, we're missing a huge part of what the Bible's supposed to be, which is fostering this relational conversation in which we're hanging out with Jesus. I also think there was, there was also something that I heard my whole life that always was a little bit unsettling, and I didn't realize until maybe 15 years ago why? Until I started reading the Bible relationally. And this, what I've heard, maybe some of you have heard this. Have you ever heard this? God has something to teach you every day. Have you heard that? It's not true. Some of you are like, so why did you invite this guy, Andrew? I'm super uncomfortable right now. It's not, let, me, let me ask you this. And this isn't one of those rhetorical, just kind of the pastor's asking a question and we don't really have to answer. I'm actually asking for an answer. Is God or is God not your heavenly father? Yes. yes. Okay. So, yes. Let me ask you this. How many parents are in the room? Are there some days when you teach your kids something? Are there days when you discipline them? Are there days when you comfort them? Are there days when you encourage them or inspire them to be more than they would be on their own? Does all that happen as a parent? Are there some days when you just bake cookies? Or watch a movie? Or go to a ball game? Or play catch? Or go to the park? Or go for a hike? Does all that happen as a parent? Let me ask you parents, are those days less valuable than the days when you teach your kids something? Wouldn't you actually say that those days are foundational to your kids receiving your instruction, receiving your comfort, receiving your discipline? Those days when we are in relationship. I believe that there are days when God wants you to read this and not learn anything. I think there are some days when he wants you to read this and just enjoy the read. Now, if you read this and he teaches you something, learn. If he corrects you on something, change. 
If he challenges you or comforts you or inspires you, all of that will happen. I'm not saying he never wants to teach you. There are many, many, many days when God wants to teach us something. Just not every day. And sometimes I think when our approach to the Bible is, if I come away from my time in the Word and I haven't identified the specific truth that I'm supposed to apply to my life and how I'm going to apply it, that somehow I've had a bad, quiet time. I don't know. If you had a friend that every single time you got together with them, they tried to teach you something, you'd be, it wouldn't be too long before you were making excuses not to hang out with them. And I think subtly some of that happens. God has much to teach us, much to correct us on, discipline us, all that. But some days I think he just wants to hang out with us. So we need to read the Bible relationally. It's the most important thing I'm going to say all morning. Second, is there anybody here who ever struggles with their mind wandering when they read the Bible? Anybody not like to raise their hand in public? Okay, I just know that other than finding a way to be consistent, have a consistent time in the Word, that's the number two most common problem people tell me about, is my mind wanders. And it's really, really frustrating because we can sit down and read a novel for two to three hours and completely ignore all responsibility. Right? Anybody else with me on that? Right? So, but then we open up the Bible, and we're like, all of a sudden you realize your mind's been wandering for a column or so. And so I, I'm going to start over. I am going to focus I am going to concentrate. I am not going to have my squirrel, right? And then off we go. And we're, oh, it's so frustrating. And, and I found that this is something that even after I had internalized Philippians, I had internalized John, I knew how amazing God's word was. And I was starting to share that with people. Still on a daily kind of regular basis, my, the focus, it was just frustrating. And there, were, there was a day when not only could I not get a couple par- chapters in, I couldn't get a couple paragraphs in without my brain being all over the place. And so finally, after about 10 minutes of trying to restart and all that kind of stuff, I just finally closed my Bible and I'm driving to the next meeting and, and I'm just venting to God. Have you ever, has anybody else in this room ever had this conversation? God, what is wrong with me? Why can't I focus? I love you. I love your work. I love your people. I know I'm supposed to love it. What is going on here? And at one point I stopped to inhale and God said, I'd like to talk now. <laughs> so as uh, and he, he gave me this, this picture, this vision that has forever helped me with this. So as frightened as you are right now, go with me into my brain. In this vision, I was a running back on a football team. And we were on the 20-yard line, had 80 yards to go, and my number had been called. I knew that I was getting the ball. And I had done everything I was supposed to do. I had been in practice, I was in shape, I had been in the weight room, I had memorized the playbook, I knew exactly which way the quarterback was going to turn and where the hole was going to be that I was supposed to run through, and where the blockers, what blockers I was supposed to follow. And most importantly, I had visualized the end zone. I could see the six points on the board, everything. And so sure enough, the ball gets snapped, turns exactly the way I'm expecting. I grab the ball. There's the hole, exactly where I'm expecting. I run through it. There are my blockers, exactly where I'm expecting. And I start following down the field. And I get seven yards down, and I get 16 yards down, and I get 23 yards down, and then, bam, I get leveled. And I'm laying there on the ground, and stars are swirling around my head, and I'm mumbling to myself, why am I not in the end zone? I'd like to be in the end zone. I pictured the end zone. The end zone would be awesome. This hurts. Right. And a buddy comes over and helps me up, and hears me mumbling these questions, and he says, well, hey, man, there is somebody playing defense. (laughs) Have you ever thought about that? That every single time you pick this up, there's somebody playing defense. There's somebody who's actively trying to make sure you don't like it. It doesn't feel, I mean, for so many of us, when we're reading the Bible, it's, our house is quiet, we've got a cup of coffee or tea, we're in a chair we really like, the day's calm, it hasn't gone crazy yet, it's just kind of, it doesn't feel like there's a war going on, but the battle is real. 
And the, the attack starts before we ever pick this up. It's kind of like the pregame smack talk before a big game, before the Apple Cup, right? There's always the smack talk that happens for like two weeks beforehand, all the jokes about the Cougs and the Huskies, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and the, the smack talk starts before you ever pick up your Bible. It starts planting seeds in your mind like, have you seen your to-do list today? You don't have time for this. Are you kidding me right now? And... You, you don't remember what you read yesterday. Why, why do you think today's going to be any better? You shouldn't, even, you shouldn't even show up. And then, when we're actually reading, there's all the distractions that come in. And so not only do we need to read relationally, we need to read strategically. We need to have a plan. Part of that plan is prayer. Recognizing that there's a defense. Most of us don't even acknowledge that there's a defense even on the attack. Do you imagine a football team going out to play a game and they didn't realize there was another team and wondered why they kept falling down randomly? It doesn't make sense. And I'm also not saying that reading strategically, that recognizing there's a defense and, ha- and praying, that, that all of a sudden your mind is never going to wander anymore. That doesn't make sense. That's like the kid that comes up to the coach and says, coach, put me in. I figured out a way to never get tackled. Right. You can't put that kid in. He's got a concussion. Right? And <laughs> we, need to have a, we need to have a plan and read strategically, recognizing that there's a defense. And then, moving from our mindset, our approach, our strategy, reading into, well, what do we do when we actually have our Bibles open? I realized something when I was reading through Philippians over and over again. And then I was reading through the Gospel of John, and I was realizing I was enjoying it more than I ever had. I was remembering it more, better than I ever had before. I was understanding it better than I ever had before. And I was like, what am I? I'm just reading it. What, why is this making more sense and being more fun? And I'm remembering it and carrying it with me. And I realized that for the first time in my life, I was reading the Bible the way that God has wired our brains to naturally and enjoyably learn anything, which is from the general to the specific. We naturally learn. I I don't care what it is that you like to do. Think of any hobby that you like, whether you love the nitty-gritty of the details of sports stuff or whether you like cooking or whether you like technology or I don't care what hobby it is that you like, I'm guessing that you learned it from the general to the specific, right? I love to cook and I love to cook Italian food. Now, if I was going to teach somebody, they were going to come over to my kitchen, it was lesson one on cooking Italian food. Lesson one would not be all of the uses for basil, Right? That wouldn't be like, if you're going to cook Italian food long term, you should probably know a thing or two about basil. It's just not lesson one. Right? And I played a lot of soccer growing up. But if I was going to teach somebody about soccer, I wouldn't have the first lesson be here are the different times when you play a diamond defense versus a five-man back versus a flat defense versus an arc defense, and here's why you play those. For most of you right now, I'm guessing that I just, for those 15 seconds, I sounded like the adults in a Charlie Brown cartoon. Wah, 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 wah. I should probably start with 11 people here, 11 people here, no hands, right? And then we can kind of break it down from there. Anybody like movies? Like anybody like twisty turny movies where you don't know who the good guy is or the bad guy is, and then in the last scene, it was the dog. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's say that after this is over, we all go get some sandwiches, and then we come back in and we put a movie up here. And at the end of scene one, I push pause and say, "Let's discuss." Okay, that was awkward. Play. Scene two. Pause. Discuss. Wouldn't that be awesome? We could just have, we could just go deep. No, it wouldn't take very long before a couple of you would be like, hey, weird man from the other side of the mountains, put the remote down. Let's, let's, let's watch the movie. Now, after we've watched the movie, 
And we don't mind having a conversation about one scene, one character, one plot twist, the cinematography, the musical score. Fine, great. But let's watch the movie first. I think one of the big reasons why most people don't enjoy reading this is that we study this book like we're studying the scenes of a movie we've never watched. So let me ask you this. If you've heard this, I want you to raise your hand and keep your hand up in the air. You can go low if you want, but I want you to keep your hand up in the air. If you've heard this, until I tell you to put it down, I want you to put your hand up in the air. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Okay, you've heard that before? Keep your hand up in the air if you can tell me what book of the Bible that's in. 2 Timothy. We know the scene. We've heard sermons on it. We've seen it written on encouraging cards. We've seen it quoted in books. But if you took 2 Timothy, a book that would take you a whopping 12 minutes to read. Yeah, it's four chapters, but it's actually shorter than Philippians. And take you about 12 minutes if you're reading out loud at a normal rate of speed. Philippians, I mean, 2 Timothy is going to take you about 12, maybe 13 minutes to read. If you took 2 Timothy and you read it every day for the next month, and I know you're going to be reading Mark, so do this in the spring. But if you took 2 Timothy and you read it every day for the next month, you would never read, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith the same ever again. 2 Timothy is... Yes, it's part of Paul's letters, but you realize that every single time you read 2 Timothy, you're eavesdropping. 2 Timothy, in Paul's mind, wasn't written for you. Paul wasn't writing that to the church in Philippi or the churches in Galatia. He was writing it to Timothy, my dear son. Now, obviously, God in his sovereignty was doing something miraculous, and Timothy ended up sharing it, and we now have it. So was it written for you that way? Yes. But when Paul was writing the words of 2 Timothy, he didn't have you in mind. He didn't have any church in mind. He was writing to Timothy, my dear son. He wanted to see him. He was on death row writing the last letter that we have from him. When you're on death row, you leave all the fluff out. 2 Timothy is is this heartfelt letter between two really, really good friends one of whom is about to die and knows he's not getting out anymore. He's been in jail plenty of times. And we can talk about why. My belief is that every once in a while, God put Paul in prison just so he'd slow down enough to write stuff. Right? (laughs) But 2 Timothy, he's in prison. And unlike Philippians, also written from prison, but in Philippians he says, I am confident that I myself will come soon. In 2 Timothy, he has said the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. It means so much different when we we read more, when we read big chunks of it. I'm going to just take five or ten more minutes. Is that good? Ten more minutes. All right. Ten minutes, 45, 60, whatever. I'll have you out of here by game time. And no. When we read more, It just, our brains naturally click into the storytelling. Reading studies have shown that it takes about 10 minutes of reading anything before your brain naturally kicks into that, what I call the storytelling mode, where your your brain starts to picture the characters and hear their voices and all that. Like, you ever read a novel and then seen the movie based on the novel? You ever had that experience, right? And every casting director is an idiot. Right? You're looking at, have you ever, am I the only one who's audibly said at a movie screen, are you kidding? Right? That person was taller, shorter, blonde hair, brown hair, whatever. And uh, it's because, but, but I'm guessing that you didn't read a page a day. The next novel you read, read a page a day. Tell me how awesome that is. Right? No, but it says it takes about 10 minutes to get into that mode where you, your brain starts to enjoy what you're reading. 
So I'm just going to hang that little piece of information on this hook. Now, here are the three most common ways that people read the Bible. It covers probably 95% of regular Bible readers. By far, the most common is to read using a devotional book and reading the section of Scripture that that devotional book tells you to read for the day. That's by far that covers 60 to 70% of people that read the Bible regularly. That's how they read the Bible. It's with a devotional book. The average section of Scripture in a devotional book will take you between 30 and 60 seconds to read. The actual scripture portion of your reading for the day, 30 to 60 seconds. Second most common is the way that I was raised, which is the chapter a day method. You're supposed to read a chapter a day, work your way through Paul's letter, or work your way through one of the gospels or something, read a chapter a day. The average chapter of scripture read out loud at a normal rate of speed will take 30 seconds either side of four minutes. About four minutes to read. Third most common, for people who want a really, really big Bible reading challenge, they read the Bible in a year, right? Who here has started that, right? Second week of February is always brutal, right? That's when most people quit. The average actual daily reading of Scripture in a one-year Bible plan is about 11 to 12 minutes. Those are the three most common ways that people read the Bible, and it takes about 10 minutes before we start to enjoy it, which means a vast majority, 80 to 90% of people who read the Bible regularly never even come close, never even get halfway to the place where their brain would start to enjoy what they're reading, and the people who do quit within two minutes. So I'm not talking about from believing it, trusting it, applying it seeing it as unique, valuing it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about from an enjoying the Bible standpoint, most of us, from the, just simply the way that we read the Bible, we're actually training our brains not to enjoy it. Isn't that crazy? So my challenge, if you're going to be jumping into one of these connection groups, which you guys are all signing a contract as you walk out that you will join. I'm just kidding. And uh, <laughs> when you're reading the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark is 16 chapters. I would encourage you to just figure out how much time you could read. Can you read for 20 minutes a day? Just set aside 20 minutes and just say, you know what, I'm going to read for 20. If you've got longer, great. But set aside 20 minutes and just read. And wherever you get to, finish that. At, when your timer goes off at 20 minutes, finish the chapter you're in, put a bookmark in, and start the next day, wherever you were, and read for another 20 minutes and watch. Because here's the deal, like if Andrew and I were getting together once a week and I was going to stick with my chapter a day method, it's going to take me, if I never ever miss a day, if I'm perfectly 100% consistent, it's going to take me two weeks and two days to finish the Gospel of Mark one time, right? If Andrew says, you know what, I'm going to read for 20 minutes a day. Do you realize that in that same 16-day period, he'll read the Gospel of Mark three times? Maybe four. Between three and four times in that same 16 days. Simply by changing his mindset from I'm going to read for an amount of content to I'm going to read for an amount of time, he's going to enjoy it more. He's going to remember it better. Certainly way better than I would at that point. So read more. And then read again. If you want to, while you're doing this study, there's going to come, there will come a point in the study where you are having discussions about the scenes. But I would encourage you during this season to at least once a week either watch the movie by reading it or watch the movie by listening to it while you're studying the scenes, while you're having conversations about the scenes of the movie, keep watching the movie and watch how many different connections you make when you're studying and you're having a discussion about this parable, about this scene, about this miracle, about this teaching. How you go, oh yeah, I, that reminds me of what happened in chapter 12 and you're going to be in chapter 3. It's the coolest thing when you can see the movie. And that happens when we read not only more of it, but when we read again when we stay in something and we read repetitiously. You've heard this before. Repetition is the mother of all learning. The beautiful thing about repetition is it works to trigger our memory without us having to do anything else. 
when we look, I mean, how many of you have ever been driving down the street and you hear a song come on the radio you haven't heard in 20 years? And you sing, you're singing along by line two, right? It's not because you sat down and you ever tried to memorize that song. It was just on the radio over and over again. And you started singing along with the chorus and then you started singing along and you realized at one point you knew the whole thing and you were just singing along with it. And it just cements in our brain. How many of you, you know, you have... Uh, songs from your kids and grandkids like little TV shows like how many of you have Veggie Tale songs in your head you wish would go away right you never tried to memorize them but they were just on all the time and so read more and read again and early on I would I would encourage you last two little points does anybody here have a study Bible with more notes on the page than actual scripture? Right, you've got maps and charts and graphs and outlines and all those kinds of things. I love my study Bibles, but my encouragement to you when you're first starting in the Gospel of Mark or whatever it is that you're going to be studying, when you're first starting in there, read alone. Leave your study Bible on the side and grab a Bible. It doesn't, I, you might be able to read using your study Bible and just read the scripture. I can't. I'm a, I'm a ping pong reader. Here's how you know if you're a ping pong reader. When you're reading in your study Bible and you see a bold letter A, do you feel a moral obligation to go down to the bottom, read what it actually says, then go back up to the pong, back up to the top, read, there's a B, ping, down to the bottom, pong, back up to the top, read. <laughs> so, so for me, I had to buy a Bible with no notes because I know that I can't do it. And so early on, when it's time to just watch the movie, early on for the first two, three weeks, four weeks maybe, of your study of Mark, I just encourage you to soak in the Word. Just be with God and His Word. And then discuss with other people, which is my final point. Yes, you need to read alone. But whatever you do, don't read alone. If you want to truly enjoy God's Word, we need to be having conversations about it. Anything that you talk about, you get more interested in. Those of you that are going to watch the Seahawks game this afternoon. Some of you are going to watch it with friends, and that's super fun. Some of you will watch it on your own, but could you imagine your only experience with watching the Seahawks was you had to watch it alone, and you could never have a friend over or a family member. You're only on your own, and you couldn't ever talk about it with anybody. You couldn't tell anyone tomorrow why you are a better coach than Pete Carroll. Because I know some of you are having that conversation tomorrow. Right? You can't ever talk about it. Oh, and by the way, so that it's really just your own time watching the game, you have to have it on mute the whole time. Because it's just got to be your experience. For most people, that's their experience in the Bible. They read the Bible on their own, by themselves, and never talk about it with anybody. But whatever we talk about, we get more interested in. So if you want to move from should to want when it comes to reading and studying the Bible, I encourage you, implore you, I beg of you, read the Bible relationally, not just informationally. Read the Bible strategically. Read more of it. Read it again. Read alone. Or whatever you do. Don't read alone. Amen? Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for Columbia Grove Covenant Church, for the people in this room and who are watching online and are investing in this community. God, I pray for each person here that the next time we pick up your word, we would meet you relationally. We would start to enjoy God's word more and more and more as we get to know and fall more deeply in love with you, the author. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.